Okay, yeah, everybody should have a set of notes in front of them for uh, lesson 46. And the title is Final Thoughts on the Corollary and Extent of Preservation. So what the objective is this morning is to kind of wrap up this section where we've been talking about the corollary and extent of preservation so that then we can move on to some other material and information. So last week in Lesson 45, we finished our two-part discussion of Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and its impact upon the doctrine of preservation. In conclusion, we observe the following. So this is a quote out of the end of the notes from last week. Okay, Matthew 5, 17 and 18... <coughs> Uh, is Matthew 5, 17 and 18 is simply teaching that no detail of the law is going to go unfulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the perfect fulfillment of the righteous requirements of the law. Given that the passage is not asserting that the Old Testament was preserved with exact identicality, there is no reason to argue by extension that Matthew 5, 18 through 19 is teaching the verbatim preservation of the New Testament. This is a King James only argument used to buttress their position of perfect or ver uh, verbal plenary preservation. If God intended to preserve his word with verbatim identicality, he, we would have historical slash textual evidence that preservation occurred with this level of precision. No such evidence exists. This, is due, this does not mean that one must abandon their belief in the promise of preservation in the face of variant readings. Rather, it means that one must amend their understanding of preservation to match what the Bible teaches about the matter. So, to be clear, I do believe in a perfect Bible, if by perfect one means the following. I believe in perfect preservation, if by perfect one means the existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, His nature or character, His doctrine, His dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology, or science that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve His Word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. So that's a review statement straight out of the end of the notes from last week. Okay, So we've been at this now for four or five weeks trying to really hammer down on, on some of these issues related to the extent of preservation and the nature of the corollary between preservation and inspiration. In Lessons 41 and 42, we considered whether preservation was the corollary of inspiration. We concluded that a, corollary, that a corollary between the two doctrines does exist in a general sense, but that there is an inherent danger in overstating the connection. We concluded that the corollary is carried too far when one demands that preservation occurred with verbatim identicality. In Lesson 43, we looked at four categories of scriptural proof demanding that it was that demonstrating, excuse me, that it was excessive to demand verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. Okay? In the first place, number one, how the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament. Number two, how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Number three, how the New Testament quotes the New Testament. And number four, the comparison between 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37. All right? So, having considered how Matthew 5, 17, and 18 fits into this discussion, we've done that in the last two weeks, we are now ready to conclude our discussion of the corollary and the extent of preservation. To accomplish this task, we are going to look at the following points in this lesson. Number one, we're going to look at the argument from authority. And number two, we're going to look at some final thoughts on the extent of preservation. Okay. Now, before we get into the new information here, is everybody understanding that, that sort of introduction slash summary or review of where we've been over the last four or five lessons? Okay. So, does the Bible promise preservation? Yes. People run into problems when they carry the corollary too far. Okay. The idea that preservation demanded verbatim identicality was an overstating of the issue to begin with. I identified to you the two positions, the originals only position, the faith for faith sake position, that those are dead ends. I didn't bring the computer today because I just didn't have time to uh, put it together. All right. I talked to you about how the answer then is not to abandon preservation. The answer is not to say that God didn't promise preservation or try to explain away all of the texts in the scripture that teach preservation. The answer is to go back to your Bible and have your Bible inform you about how to think about the matter. And in doing so, that's what we 
uh, that's what we concluded. I have a chart here that I've been working on that I'm not quite ready to share yet uh, publicly just because there's some things on it I still might want to tweak. But I'll just hold it up so that you can kind of get the gist of it. At the bottom, I've identified the originals only position, the faith for faith sake position in the center, and then the amended position here. Okay? And I've included these two as dead ends. And then here, underneath this one, I have a reset button. Okay? What I'm suggesting to you is that this position that we're in the process of, of outlining here is a hitting of a reset button so to speak this is the this year is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation one of the core doctrines of the Protestant Reformation was the idea of sola scriptura that your that by scripture alone was the authority okay but what has happened as I've tried to demonstrate to you is that in the latter half of the 19th century that that fundamental core Protestant principle was abandoned in the face of opposition and they reinserted a bunch of philosophical and rationalistic presuppositions into the equation and what they end up doing is fundamentally abandoning the position of sola scriptura because now the authority they're getting authority not from the scripture they're getting authority from from their rationalistic presuppositions so th this is I, I really believe that what we're talking what we're in the process of outlining here is is something of a reset button a resetting of the thinking about inspiration and preservation based upon what the scriptures teach. Nobody believes that inspiration is confined to the originals only from reading a Bible. They did not get that idea from the Bible, they got that idea from philosophical presuppositions. Okay? As we move forward, I'm going to show you verse after verse after verse where God says the same thing. He calls copies of the Word of God Scripture, and he identifies them as having equal authority and weight as those original autographs themselves. Okay? So that's kind of what we're in the process of doing here. So I'm not going to share this totally with, with everyone yet and not make it available uh, for folks who might be watching on the internet just because I, I want to make sure that I'm happy with it before I, I share it out. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of that? Yeah. It's just interesting to think about, you know, when you think about like Luke and Jesus reading from a copy that if we look at from the original to now, we can we can understand because of variant readings that there's been minor changes to it. So it's logical to assume that some of those changes would have occurred from the writing to Jesus seeing it, not just all of them from that point to now. It's just one example. So he, it's likely I'm saying that he read a copy that had some slightly different wording than what was originally penned. I th yeah, that seems that seems somewhat reasonable. I, I think that um, I will I will add to that this this point though, as we're going to see moving forward. There's not as much argument over the Old Testament text as there is over the New Testament text. One of the reasons for that is because of how the Old Testament text was preserved through the instrumentality of the nation of Israel. And so the Levites in Israel were overseeing this copying process. And so they, they, they're going to be you know, using some pretty strict methodologies and traditions to ensure that the copying is, is being done uh, with a very high degree of accuracy. Although I would agree that that does not ensure verbatim identicality. They didn't have a Xerox machine. I could take this page right here, page two. I could go down to the office, put it on the church copy machine, and every, every copy that's made would be a verbatim identically copy, identical copy to this page right here, right? They don't have that. And even with the high degree of accuracy that the Levites are copying the scriptures with, they are still prone to occasionally make some sort of a mistake or make some sort of a, have a stray line or a mark or miscount as they count up the number of letters and words and so forth in a row. It's possible that those sorts of things, you know, had already occurred to some degree by the time of Christ. And we've already seen that. Isaiah 61 in, in the Old Testament, the way that reads in the, uh, in the Old Testament doesn't match I, exactly the copy that Christ is reading from in the synagogue in Nazareth there in Luke 4. Yet, 
he still calls it, Christ still calls the copy that he's reading from in Nazareth, he calls it scripture. So that's important. That's telling you the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is not one that says, well, I don't, if I don't have the original autograph, I don't have the scripture. Okay, so yeah, that's a good point. Uh, anything else on that before we move on? All right, the argument from authority. Once again, Dr. W, uh, William W. Combs of Detroit Baptist Seminary raises this point in his essay, The Preservation of Scripture. Uh, Combs states, close, we need a uh, quotation mark at the beginning of that, Sylvia. Closely tied to the argument for preservation, based on a correlation between inspiration and preservation, is another corollary between, authority, between the authority of Scripture and preservation. Essentially, this argument is based upon the notion that for the scriptures to possess any authority, they must have been preserved in some sense. Combs quotes Harry Stiggers, uh, Harry Stiggers' essay, Preservation, the Corollary of Inspiration, to illustrate this secondary use of the corollary. Stigger says, the preservation of scripture is bound up with their authority, so that the two are reasonably indissolvable. The former is, most, is a most necessary outgrowth of their inspiration. So let's kind of look at what the heck they're talking about there just a little bit. In essence, Stiggers is arguing that since the scriptures are authoritative and an authority that comes from inspiration, the scriptures can have no continuing authority unless they are preserved. Okay, so how did we get the scriptures? We got the scriptures by inspiration, right? Do, we, do all Bible-believing people view the scriptures as authoritative? Okay, so unless the contents of that inspiration were preserved in some manner, we would have no reason for viewing the scriptures as what? Authority. Authoritative. That's essentially what he's saying. Okay. Um, in other words, the scriptures possess their authority precisely because they were given by inspiration of God. Likewise, if the words given by inspiration were not preserved, the scriptures would not retain their authority. This is a different approach to the corollary than we have seen thus far in our study of the corollary based upon verbatim identicality of wording. So what we've seen so far is <coughs> that guys have either said there's a corollary or not a corollary based upon the standard of what? Verbatim identicality, okay? So some are going to say, like, like uh, Daniel Wallace and uh, Glennie, they're going to say, oh, there's, there's no cor corollary. Well, remember, they don't really believe in the promise of preservation to start with, right? And so they have to insert it in the back door as a historical reality, not as a biblical promise. We've already talked about those things. This particular approach is a little bit different. It's not arguing for um, it's not arguing for a corollary based upon exact sameness or verbatim identicality of wording. It's arguing for it based upon authority. So if God gave His word by inspiration, and that word has authority, well, the only way that's possible for it to still have authority is if what He gave by inspiration was what preserved. Okay. In a 1973 essay, Autographs, Amanuensis, and Restricted Inspiration, Greg L. Bashan states the following regarding dependable preservation, what he calls dependable preservation. It is certainly legitimate for us to maintain that God in His sovereignty has preserved His Word in dependable form to all generations. To be a Christian requires the possession of God's words as a basis for faith and direction in life, and men in all generations are responsible to be Christians. Concerning the authority, so what is he saying there? He's, he's essentially saying that God's obligated to preserve it in a dependable form. Okay, now, that's not all that different necessarily from what I'm saying. At least what he says in those four, three or four lines there is not all that different from what I'm saying. I'm saying that you do have a dependable representation of what God said and that it is authoritative and that it was preserved even though it may not be verbatimly identical to the original autographs themselves. Okay, And we've been over four reasons why that could be the case from the scriptures. Concerning the authority of scripture, Dr. Wayne Grudem stated the following in his popular systematic theology. He says, quote, the authority of Scripture means that all the words in Scripture 
are God's words in such a way that to disbelieve or disobey any word of Scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God. Okay, again, that seems to me like a pretty reasonable statement. All right? Now, but understand, he's not coming to that statement by arguing for a verbatim identicality standard of preservation. He's coming to that statement by just saying, look, if God gave something by inspiration and I'm a Christian and I'm supposed to follow what God said, then God must have what? Preserved, Preserved it. Okay? So, this type of authority is found in the fact that these words were given by inspiration of God. The, purpose, the purposes for which Scripture... The purposes for which Scripture is profitable, namely doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, cannot be fulfilled unless the Scriptures are what? Preserved. Okay? This is where Combs sees the impact of texts like Matthew 5, 17, and 18. Now, that's the text we were talking about for the last two weeks, right? And we talked about how that jot and tittle idea, some take that and say everything has to be pristinely identical to, and, and everything has to be just so, and if one word is spelled different, one thing is, is in a different place, then the text is incapable of, ex of expressing what God said, okay? Um, here we see that secondary use uh, that we talked about last time of Matthew 5, 17 and 18, right? So is Christ going to fulfill every John and tittle, all the details of the law? Yes. Has he, is the entire, every, has everything written back there in that law, in that Old Testament, has that all been fulfilled yet? No. Is there some of it that awaits a yet future fulfillment from a dispensational standpoint? Okay. So does it continue then to have to be preserved in order for Christ to fulfill those things out there in the future? Okay. So that's, that's what he's getting at. Uh, this is where Matthew 5, 17 and 18 and John 10, 35 also tie into the doctrine of preservation. Since both of these passages teach a continuing authority for Scripture, as we have demonstrated, they indirectly support a doctrine of preservation. But the same can be said for numerous texts that command the believer's obedience. If these texts are essential to the believer's sanctification, and they are, they must have been what? Preserved, okay? So does everybody see how this authority argument is a little bit different from what we've been studying before, okay? Um, in this way, then, Combs and others maintain a belief in the promise of preservation in a general sense. Preservation must have occurred or else the scriptures would have no enduring authority. In this way, preservation is the corollary of inspiration. All right, now before we go on to the next point, does anybody have any questions or comments about that section? <coughs> I'm hesitant to do this, but so I would like, just so I'm clear that we got this, can somebody explain to me the difference between this authority argument versus a verbatim identicality or exact sameness argument? So what I'm doing as a teacher is asking you, the student, to explain back to me what I've said so I know we've got it. Anybody want to venture into that water? So with authority, you're saying that it must be preserved to maintain God's authority. And so because there are things that, like you said, still have to be fulfilled, so they must continue to be preserved. And with hopefully of identicality is basing it more on this we have to preserve everything exactly the same to make sure that we get everything. I think that's generally what I'm saying. Anybody else? Do you understand what 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 I'm coming on now, right, Caleb? Yes? Yeah. yeah, I think you do, yeah. generally. Yeah, I get the general sense of it. Okay. The problem with verbatim identicality is once you identify that there's a question on a word, now the whole structure is starting to teeter. Yeah, because now all, all we have to do is point out the fact that there are, <coughs> there are variants, and now what are we going to do? How are, who's going to tell me which one got everything exactly right? Okay. If it's verbatim identicality, you don't have an authority because you, nothing matches. Right. 
And ultimately, you end up exactly back. Now think about this. If that's your standard, then you end up exactly back where the other guys are in position one, where now you become the authority and you get to pick which edition, which printing, which whatever is the, is the, is the one that got everything exactly what. Right, and that's fundamentally the very thing that King James only advocates or those who are in favor of position two would criticize those in position one for. Okay, that's why these are both marked dead ends because when you get to the end of these, they, they, they functionally basically leave you in the exact same, with the exact same problem. Nate? Do a lot of the position one guys hold this form of corollary then? That is a great question. I would say it depends on the guy. Combs, obviously, yes. Wallace and Glenny, no, because they don't think that God ever promised to preserve in the first place. So remember when we studied how Glenny makes this huge argument about how he's got to insert preservation in through the back door to protect his doctrine of canonicity. Remember we went over that? Okay. So I would say not necessarily. But if you state this like... Combs did here, where but the same can be said for numerous texts that command the believer's obedience. If these texts are essential to the believer's sanctification, and they are, they must have been preserved. That's almost begging the question. That's he's really close to circular reasoning with, with stating it like that. He is. But so we've got the law. Are there things in the law that haven't been fulfilled? Are there things in Paul's epistles that were written for our obedience today in the dispensation of grace? So if, if those things are written for our obedience, do we, have to, do we have to have those things as believers in order for us to follow them and obey them? Right. And I, I'm not, I don't mean obey and like a, really obey. I mean it like believe and try to act out by faith in the details of your life. Yeah. Well, it's reasonable to assume that if God is going to expect you to follow those, that he would make available to you clear instructions to follow. The other thing is, I brought this point up one other time, but go to Romans 16 quick. <coughs> yeah. I think the thing is, the Bible um, presents itself and proves itself as the authority before we even get this far. It can... It can be the authority because it presents itself, itself as the authority by just um, you know, the different things of like prophecy and, and all these different things that, that... Right. Which again, if so, so therefore, if the Scripture is promised to preserve and God said He's going to do this, then He had to have done something. Right. He had to have acted in some way to secure that what He said He was going to do, that He actually what? He actually did. And see, this is what I'm saying. If you pay attention to the Scripture, look at Romans 16.25. Now, do you remember the verse in Acts? Let me see if I can find it. No, that's not the one. I know why you're telling me that, but that's, that's not the one I want in this instance. Uh, I want the one where he talks about how he left the Gentiles without... Wi okay, I got it. Acts 14. So get, 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 get Acts 14 in one hand and Romans 16 in the other. Okay? Now, Paul tells you... Oh, and also get Romans chapter 2 in your third hand. And actually, I want that one first. Romans chapter 2. No, Romans 3, verse 1. Romans chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit of their circumcision? Now watch verse 2. Much every way, chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Who did God commit his word to in time past? He committed his word to the nation of Israel, right? So does the Jew have an advantage in time past... One of the ways the Jew has an advantage in time past is because God spoke to and through that nation, right? And he committed his oracles unto that nation, right? Now, we know that God, we know dispensationally that God suffered the Gentiles to walk in their own way. Go to Acts 14. Verse 15. 
and saying, Sirs, why do you these things? We are all men of like passage with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own want. So when the, Gentiles, and when the Gentiles choose not to retain God in their knowledge, and God gives them over to a reprobate mind back there in Genesis chapter 11, okay, he, Paul, he calls out Abraham, and he makes a distinction in Abraham, he makes a division in the earth between circumcision and uncircumcision, and then he commits all, the, all of his word in time past is committed unto who? Israel. Okay? Now... Does that mean that he leaves the Gentiles? Uh, do the Gentiles, even in that time past system, do they still have a witness? Yeah. Okay, look at the next verse. <laughs> Nevertheless, he left himself, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave rain from heaven and fruitful season, filling our hearts with what? Do you see anything there about the witness that God gave to the Gentiles in time past having anything to do with access to God's Word. So is God obligated in time past to give His Word to the Gentiles? No. Yes or no? No, He's not. Now go to Romans 16. <coughs> Any access that a Gentile has to the Word of God is going to come indirectly through his contact with an Israelite. Okay, But now look at how the situation has changed. Romans 16, verse 25. Now to him that has the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets. Now watch. According to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all what? Nations for the obedience of faith. So let me ask you a question. Has there been a change in the dispensation? Has the change in the dispensation resulted in a change in how the Word of God is going to be handled and dealt with, right? So, this mystery, this is for all of who? All the nations. So, does that mean all the nations are going to have to learn Greek to have access to the mystery? Or is this, if you're paying attention, is God telling you that in order for the nations to have access to His Word, His Word is going to have to be what? Translated into the languages of the nations. Uh-oh. Okay, so then that means then, are those nations going to be inhibited in any way because their access to the knowledge of the mystery is only going to come to them through a translation? Or is that going to be as equally authoritative for them to believe and place faith in and have access and knowledge of what God is doing today in the dispensation of grace through, uh, and, and knowledge of the mystery through those translations are going to have to be, that are going to have to be produced in order for the nations to have access to what God is now doing through Paul in the dispensation of grace. Does everybody see what I'm saying? So my point is this. All of this rigmarole and all this mumbo-jumbo that the theologians have come up with about limiting everything to the originals only, that is not an idea that somebody ever got for a 10 seconds as a result of reading God's Word. That is a completely philosophical supposition that was imposed upon the Scripture to meet the German rationalists and higher critics right where they were. That was nothing anybody ever thought of before this point. <coughs> Now, I'm going to say one more thing about this, but I'm going to be cautious about what I say because I haven't fully thought it through, right? In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, you have Jews and proselytes. Why don't you turn to Acts 2? My notes are a little bit shorter today, so I have a little bit of time, hopefully. I'll probably regret this at the end, but... <laughs> Acts chapter 2, verse, um, I want, what do I want here? Verse 5. So in verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance at the end of verse 4. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under what? Heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard every man speak in the Hebrew language. 
No, in your own time. So how does a, and then read the next verse. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? In other words, a bunch of uneducated hillbilly hippies? Mm -hmm. How here we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and so on and so on and so on, right? Now let me ask you a question. How is a believing Jew in Egypt going to have access to the law? Is he going to have to learn Hebrew? I'm just, I'm just raising a question here that, that's on my mind. Okay, My point is when, they, when this happens here, when this miracle occurs here in Acts chapter 2, they don't all hear the apostles speaking in Hebrew. They hear them all speaking in their own what? In their own languages. Okay, so after Israel is run away, is after the northern kingdom is sacked by Assyria, and after the southern kingdom is, is taken into captivity by the Babylonians, are their Israelites literally spread all throughout the Mediterranean world? Okay, so do all of those folks all have to speak Hebrew in order to have access to what God said? You see the question. Okay. And it's an interesting question to me because when the, when the miracle happens here in Acts 2, they don't all hear him speaking in Hebrew. They hear him speaking in their own what? In their own tongue. Now, I told you, that's not a fully, that's just a thought I'm having, okay? So if somebody in here wants to help me out with that and give it some more thought along with me and talk, talk discuss it, that's partly why I brought it up. All right, so... The bottom line here is that the scriptures have what? Authority. The reason they have authority is because of inspiration. The reason that authority continues is because of what? Preservation. preservation. All right. So, final thoughts on the extent of preservation. It is only when one demands that preservation requires the same precision as inspiration, i.e. verbatim identicality, that the corollary runs into trouble. Lessons 42 through 35 were devoted to highlighting this point. When discussing the extent of preservation, one must clearly identify what they mean by the words perfect, pure, and error. By perfect, most commentators on both sides of the issue, so that would be those in position one or two, okay, most commentators mean verbatim identicality. Consider the following statements made by Dr. Combs. He says, quote, How pure have the original words of the how pure have the original words of the biblical writings been preserved? It is an indisputable fact proven by the manuscript, manuscripts and versional evidence that God has not perfectly, that is without error, preserved the scriptures throughout their long history of transmission. There is no single manuscript, printed text, or version that can be shown to be error-free. This is patently obvious to anyone who is at all familiar with the transmission history of the Scriptures. First, we should note that no two Greek manuscripts of the New Testament agree exactly. These thousands of manuscripts all differ from one, uh, from one another to some degree. No one has ever suggested, even within the King James Texas Receptus camp, that a particular one of these manuscripts is a perfect copy of the autographs that is error-free. I don't know if that's true if you listen to uh, the Glistering Truths guy from Bible Protector and the pure Cambridge position. This conclusively demonstrates that God has permitted errors to enter the transmission process, which is an inevitable result of providential preservation. Okay? Now, that's what Combs said. Here's my response. Mark well that for Combs, an error constitutes a textual variant of any kind. Okay? So, when Combs is talking about an error... <coughs> An error for him equals any textual variant. 
Okay? Now, what does that mean? That means a different spelling. That means, you know, a, a stray mark. That means anything that's what? Different. So let's go back to the notes. <coughs> mark well for Combs, an error constitutes a textual variant of any kind. In this way, he is assuming verbatim identicality as the standard for preservation. Okay? Now, how's he doing that? Because he said, well, an error is any, text, is, is any textual variant of any kind. He says nothing about the nature of the variant. Okay? Any textual variant is the nature of any kind. So what he's ultimately saying is that pres what his standard here is what? His standard then is verbatim identicality. In this way, he is assuming verbatim identicality as a standard for preservation. When one biblically amends their position on preservation, see lessons 42 and 43, and thereby realizes that preservation did not occur with exact identicality, it brings the entire discussion on the extent of preservation into focus. On this amended view of preservation, an error would constitute a variant that substantively alters the doctrinal content of the Bible. Does everybody see that? Okay. So, what we're saying is an error is a difference that alters what? A difference that alters the substantive content slash what so can you have a difference and not have it be what an error, an error. on Combs's view an error is any any what any variant because he's assuming verbatim identicality is everybody following that so let's be clear this is Combs let's move read on on this amended view of preservation, an error would constitute a variant that substantively alters the doctrinal content of the Bible. Variants that constitute a different way of saying the same thing are not errors because they are substantively what? Equivalent. Is everybody with that? Okay. According to this biblically adjusted view of preservation, terms, the terms pure and perfect do not demand exact identicality of wording, but simply substantively equivalent meaning. I have no problem speaking about, a pure, speaking about pure or perfect preservation if by perfect one means. Now understand, I'm going to have to qualify this for the rest of my life. Every time I say this, I'm going to have to include this disclaimer by what exactly I mean. Okay, what do I mean? The existence of a pure text that does not report information about God, his nature or character, his doctrine, his dispensational dealings with mankind, history, archaeology, or science, that is false. In short, God's promise to preserve his word assures the existence of a text that has not been altered in its character or doctrinal content, despite not being preserved in a state of what? Verbatim identicality. Okay, now that's the same thing we said at the beginning. If preservation did not occur with this level of perfection or purity, then how could the scriptures have any authority as is identified in point one? So, do we have a pure text? Do we have a text that does not tell us anything about God, his dealings in salvation, dispensational or otherwise, that's reporting anything to us that's false? So an error would be... A, a, so an error on this view would be a difference that tells you something that is substantively what? Different. So remember two weeks ago when we were looking at that passage in John where the critical text and the, and the New American Standard let, let, took out the word yet. Okay, remember that? When it's, and Christ says to the apostles, he says, I go not up, in the, the King James it says, I go not up to the feast yet. And then he says, until, I, until my time has come, or something like that, right? And he says that in verse 8, you go down two verses, and in verse 10, he's at the feast. Well, in the New American Standard Bible, and the New, New International Version, and, some of, and the other modern versions that follow the critical text, that word yet is not there. So when you take that out, now do you substantively alter the, the doctrinal content of what that verse is saying? Yes. 
Not only do you substantively alter the content of verse 8, but now you create an internal contradiction because in verse 8, Jesus says he's not going to go, but in verse 10, all of a sudden he's there. And you're like, well, what in the world? Okay? That is a difference that alters the substantive content or doctrine. Is everybody following that? Okay, so, Combs is correct to point out that the textual facts do not seem to matter to most King James only advocates. So we see that the evidence, so he says, quote, we, so we see that the evidence of manuscripts, texts, and versions means nothing to those in the King James Text Receptus camp. Most are content to double, on, double down on faith for faith's sake in the promise of preservation. After quoting statements regarding the need for <coughs> uh, the need for faith in God's word by King James advocates David Cloud and Jack Mormon, Combs states the following. He says, quote, in one sense, Mormon is absolutely correct. What the Bible teaches about its own preservation is to be accepted by faith. But that can be said of everything the Bible teaches. Everything the Bible teaches is to be accepted by faith. This argument from faith, or Craig's favorite phrase, the logic of faith, as Hills likes to call it, actually boils down to faith in the King James Version as the perfectly preserved Word of God, in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. Okay? This is not faith, at least not in the biblical sense, but pure presumption. So Hills, Hills will say, well, what, what leads you to believe this is the logic of faith. And then he's got all of these, he's got all of these um, axioms that he's got in there about, well, here, here's what the logic of faith is. Part of the problem is he never really explains how he got that from the scripture. Okay? Now, let's, let's keep going here because right now we're sort of in the middle of this and we need to finish the point. The fundamental fallacy in the King James TR position can be traced to the faulty premise that the scriptures themselves teach a perfect and inerrant preservation of the actual words of the autographs. See, now, <laughs> how's he using the word perfect? Verbatim. Verbatim. Okay. How are the King James advocates using the word perfect? Verbatim. All right. So, all Combs is doing here now is he's using their argument against them. Okay? So he said, let me read that again. The fundamental fallacy in the King James TR position can be traced to the faulty premise that the scriptures themselves teach a perfect and inerrant preservation of the actual words of the autographs. We saw this early in Flanders' statement that the actual existence of the original text will continue eternally. It is not enough to hold a Bible in one's hand, even a King James Bible, and say, this is the word of God. The King James TR position insists that one must be able to say that these are the words of God. Anything else, according to Waite, is an apostate, heretical, modernistic, or liberal position. Okay? So, in other words, if you don't agree with us about view two, you're apostate, modernistic, liberal, heretic. Okay? Combs, top page five. Combs is correct that faith in the, quote, perfectly preserved word of God cannot be maintained by faith in God's word if by perfect one means matching the original autographs with exact identicality. Now, do the scriptures teach you to think that way about it? Okay. That is a presumption, because the Word of God teaches no such doctrine. Does it teach preservation? Does it teach preservation on the standard of verbatim identicality? Why have, why have these guys in position one limited all this to the original? Because of the mount impassable here of variant readings. So because there's variant readings, well then only the original is what? Inspired, authoritative, and inerrant, right? So then these guys here are reacting to these guys, and they come up with a position in reaction to this position. 
And they, they, they enter into a whole bunch of their own presumptions and presuppositions. So before we are too hard, now it's just trying to be fair here, okay? So before we're too hard on the likes of Cloud, Waite, and Mormon, it needs to be made clear that the originals only position is equally guilty of making unbiblical rationalistic presuppositions or presumptions. There is no verse in scripture that teaches that inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy are confined to the non-existent original autographs alone. Therefore, this position cannot be held by faith in God's word either. It was a position forged as a rationalistic response to German higher criticism and rationalism during the latter half of the 19th century. It was largely on account of the existence of textual variants that inspiration, infallibility, and inerrancy were confined to the original autographs. Once again, both positions were forged by taking an equally presumptuous approach to how to account for the lack of verbatim identicality in the surviving manuscript copies. Differences in wording are not inherently a problem so long as they do, they do not report information that is false or contradictory. Listen, when Colossians chapter 2 or 3, when Colossians chapter 2 in a modern version says, the King James says, talking about the worshiping of angels, it says, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. The critical texts in the modern versions say, intruding into those things which he has seen. Is that a difference? That, that's not just, a, that's more than a different way of saying, saying the same thing. That's a substantive difference in meaning, and it's more than just a substantive, substantive difference in meaning because these two statements are directly contradictory. So they both cannot be correct. Is everybody with that? Okay. So what I'm saying is, is there a variety of ways that something could be said and have it say and mean the exact same thing? Substantive equivalence. Without having to have the wording verbatim. Is it still a problem when something is substantively different? Okay? So, let me read that sentence again. Differences in wording are not inherently a problem so long as they do not report information that is false or contradictory. This is where we must recognize the difference between, one, a different way of saying the same thing, and two, substantive differences in meaning. I know from personal experience that this distinction is lost on many King James only advocates. For many King James only advocates, such as weight, any difference of any kind constitutes a situation where one is forced to declare which reading is the Word of God, and then obviously which one would what? Not be the word of God. But the problem is there again. If that's the standard, which edition of the King James Bible is exclusively what? The word of God. The word of God since they're not all verbatim. So does it do a King James advocate any favors to adopt that as the standard? Because they are adopting a standard that they cannot what? Support, Support or prove. Okay. So, thus one cannot honestly, according to Waite, say that the New American Standard is the Word of God. He complains that if one holds his King James Bible in his hand, in his hand and the New American Standard in his hand, with uh, 5,604 differences in their Greek text in the New Testament alone, how can they both be the Word of God? Word of God could not mean the words of God because these... because of these differences in what? Now how do they get around that? They get around that by telling you this convenient fiction that the only differences in the printed editions of the King James are spelling, printer errors, and punctuation. Okay? It's not true. Weight fails to distinguish between... Now here, here, here's my comment. Weight fails to distinguish between the nature of these differences. I, this is me, I reject the critical text in the New American Standard Bible because many of these 5,604 differences are substantive. Not merely different ways of saying the same thing. But mark well, that is not what weight is saying. Okay? He is, making the, he is making the categorical statement. That should be statement, not statements. 
that any differences of wording of any kind is an attack on the Word of God. Okay? The problem here is one of consistency. The printed editions of the King James contain different wording, yet Waite is not willing to identify which edition of the King James got all the words what? Perfect. Now, let me just say that the, the, Bible, uh, the, the brother out of, Air, uh, out of uh, Australia, the Bible protector, the pure Cambridge guy, I will say this, he's at least consistent in saying in the following way. If, if that's the standard, then I have to be able to point to the one that had everything exactly what? Exactly perfect. Even if it took till 1900 to get it. That's a problem. Okay. Now for me, that's a problem. For him, he's just carrying this out to its logical what? Conclusion. He's got he's to figure out which one has it exactly what? Perfectly set. Okay. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that printers should be sloppy. I'm not saying that they should be just indiscriminately, you know, they, I, they should not be doing that kind of thing. But the fact is it's happened, right? When the editor of the 1769 edition inserts the word both into Jude 25 and it wasn't in the 1611, that's, I don't, that's not a printer error. That's a whole word that's in one that's not in the other. And how would you ever know that was a printer error or not in the absence of the manuscript that was handed, that was taken from the translators to the king's printer to know whether or not it was what? A printer error. Is everybody with that? It's really bizarre, I'm telling you, when you really start to think about some of this stuff, because now we have now we got King James advocates arguing printer error, not printer error, when they have no original edition of the when they have when they don't have the original manuscript that came from the that came from the translators and was handed to the printer to be able to make such a judgment. But isn't that the same thing they're mad at the other guys for saying when they're trying to reconstruct the original? Who yeah. see? You, I told you I'm going to get myself in trouble. I probably already have, but. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Concluding thoughts from Combs. <laughs> Professor Combs concludes his section on the extent of preservation with the following paragraph. He says, The true situation is this. God has preserved his word to this day. But because of the means he has chosen to accomplish this preservation, providentially through secondary causation, the words of the autographs have not been inherently preserved. Instead, God has chosen to allow for variations to occur. Variants within the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek copies of the autographs. God has providentially provided all these copies in order to preserve the scripture. So it is proper to say that preservation has taken place in the totality of manuscripts. Because God chose this method of preservation, it is not possible to provide a perfectly pure text with no variations, errors. It was sufficient for God's purpose to preserve His word in copies of the autographs whose exact wording contains some variation. This level of purity is sufficient for God's purposes. Let me tell you, this is a loaded paragraph that we need to dissect. Okay. In the end, Combs is partly right and partly wrong. Combs doubles down in the opposite direction of weight. So he's doubling down on position what? One. Okay. He insists that the words of the autographs have not been inherently preserved because he is assuming verbatim identicality as his standard for inherent preservation. Therefore, inerrancy is only applicable to the original autographs. Combs' insistence upon exact identicality of wording is reiterated in his statement that, quote, it was not possible to provide a perfectly pure text with no variations. For Combs, this mere, for Combs, this mere, I should say the mere presence, for Combs, the mere presence of textual variance negates perfect inerrant preservation because of how he is using those words. 
Okay? I also disagree with his conclusion that preservation occurred in the totality of manuscripts. This is not possible since some of the manuscript copies do possess substantive differences in meaning and some, in some cases, actually teach opposites. That doesn't do me any good either because I got some that, that are substantively what? Different from each other. Okay? So, in contrast, I believe Combs to be correct with respect to the following statements. Number one, God has preserved his word to this day. Number two, God has chosen to allow for variation to occur. How do we know that? Because that's what we have in the historical textual witness. We have variation. We don't have verbatim identicality. Yet we still believe God what? Preserved, preserved his word. Why do we believe he preserved his word? Because he said he would what? Preserve. preserve his word. And number three. It was sufficient for God's purpose to preserve his word in copies of the autographs whose exact wording contained some variation. This level of purity is sufficient for God's purposes. Is he right about that? Even, see, even though, he, even though he may not have the same meaning, he's partly right and he's partly what? He's partly wrong. So, next week, we will begin discussing the method of preservation by looking at whether providential is an appropriate descriptor to utilize when discussing how preservation occurred. Okay? Any questions or comments, Nate? So this answered kind of my question earlier with our, the guys in one uh, adhering to this kind of corollary because my question really was, you know, where did they get the authority from modern scripture? You know, and this is where I think he sums it up. This is the roundabout way of bringing authority back to modern versions or the Bible today. It's a providentially historically providentially guided variants that are in the totality now. So their authority from Scripture comes that God has providentially historically preserved His Word. Yeah, I think that's right. So you're, so what you're... Um, I want to make sure I'm clear about what you're saying. So th this is significant to you for what reason? Because the guys in one... The guys in two at least can say this is authoritative because God promised to preserve it and maybe even re-inspired it. So that's where they can say this is authoritative to us. The guys in option one, without preservation, can't say this is authoritative unless they have something like this in their statement that God providentially preserved in the totality of manuscripts his word. Roundabout way, but not promised. God still had to do it for this to be authoritative, though. Yeah, and that's essentially what Combs is ultimately saying. Right. Yeah. Even though, never mind the fact that there are substantive differences in these. It, so they're all preserved, but they're contradicting. Right. And so he's not, he's not being as clear, I think, as he should be. Right. But this is necessary for them to say the scriptures are. I agree. They have to have some element of God in it. And Combs is at least outlining one way that the guys in option one can say scripture is still. Clear. So what he's doing there is similar to what Wallace and Glennie did with the corollary where they insert it in the back door as a historical reality right. to salvage their position on the canon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or comments about the lesson? I I, I don't know. I don't know. How do I want to say this? I hope that what we're doing in here is not lost on everyone. Because I, I, I really do believe that what we're identifying here is a reset button that needs to be pushed to reset us back to truly a sola scriptura way of thinking about the scripture that, that, that gets rid of all of that humanistic philosophical presupposition and reasoning that was added to the doctrine, the, the, the Protestant doctrine of the canon and bibliology as a result of the controversies of the late 19th century. And see, then that's carried through. That's carried through and becomes position one. And then position two. So this position, 
is reactionary against this attack that occurred. Okay? This position here is reactionary against this position. So by the time you get here, you're two steps removed moved from what the Protestant bibliology was outlined at the top. Is everybody following that? So what I'm saying, and in a biblically amended view of preservation, is we let the Bible teach us how to think about the preservation, we hit a reset button, and we can get rid of a lot of this really bad, poor thinking and reasoning that never really made a lot of sense to begin with, but that was picked up on and repeated because we were defending ourselves against a clear error. Okay? At the end of the day, folks, I, I'm a King James advocate. Okay? I'm just a King James advocate for a lot of different reasons than I used to be. Because I know that I can read in English that when I compare this King James Bible with modern versions, that there are substantive differences. And I'm not going to pretend like the, like the folks in position one that, well, well, you know, as long as the deity of Christ is in there somewhere, we're good. That doesn't do me any good about how, that, how a verse like Colossians 1.14 should read. To say that it's okay to leave out the blood of Christ in Colossians 1.14 because it's in Ephesians 1 doesn't tell me anything about how Colossians 1.14 should read. Okay? And when Colossians 1.14 in the King James Bible says through faith in... Or, uh, aye, aye, aye. Redemption through His blood, yes. And a modern version says... Redemption that's in Christ Jesus doesn't say anything about his blood. Well, okay. It's not good enough for me to say, it, 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 it's not helpful to me to say, oh, that, that's, there's no doctrinal difference there because it's in some other verse somewhere else. That's not the point. The point is, what did God say in Colossians 1.14? Okay. Anyway, we're, we're, we got to quit. I, I knew I'd finish late, even though I said we had time, but appreciate your attention.